So uh, we're actually going to be talking for the next uh, hour on the, um, the same topic, really, that uh, Jeff was addressing us on, which is God's love and God's suffering and the biblical image for God's nature frequently is fire and uh, the fire of God's holiness. And as I was working through this and preparing this talk, I just was uh, overwhelmed by how dominant this image is when you start getting into it, start looking for it and tracing the pattern through scripture, this image of God's holiness as fire. Of course, holiness um, is the word that we use to describe what is unique about God's nature. And so to a certain extent, we can try to get at a definition of holiness, but it always remains elusive because it's a, sort of a, a process of elimination. And in, in theology, they call that the, the apophatic process. You know, God is so inexpressible, you have to often say what he is not. So we, we say things like God is infinite. That means not finite, right? We can't really directly express what the infinite is. We can just say it's not limited. And we say um, he is, uh, you know, uh, without boundary in these other areas as well. He's uh, omnipotent. He's all potent and uh, all powerful and all present. So there's no limitation to his presence, no limitation to his power, just without limit in those areas. And uh, so it's hard to express the essence of God, but this word holiness is what we use for that. And uh, as I said, the biblical image of this is fire. But we also know that God is love, as St. John the Apostle teaches us. And we know that God is self-gift. He is always giving of himself a circle of self-giving love among the persons of the Trinity. And of course, when we're taken up into that circle of self-giving love, it causes us pain because we, unlike God, are not infinite. We are finite. And so there's a limit to what we can give. And when we reach that limit, that's where suffering comes in. And so we experience suffering when we're caught up into the cycle and the circle of our God who is always self-giving, which never causes him pain, so to speak, because there's no end to himself to give. So um, let's, uh, let's pray and we'll get into it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for this opportunity to meditate on your word. And we pray that indeed, as we do so, you would send down upon us the power of your Holy Spirit, the flame of your Holy Spirit to illumine our minds with light and to heat our hearts with your divine warmth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we know that this image of fire is important in Scripture. We're probably familiar, for example, with uh, the description of God's appearance to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, which is really a defining moment in salvation history for God's self-revelation, uh, this, this public unveiling of God's nature to this mass of, uh, according to the biblical figures, you know, 600,000 people at the feet of Mount Sinai. And it says, now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. The Hebrew's dramatic, Eish Ohelech. It's the fire that eats, okay? The eating fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And that was God's self-revelation at Sinai. And 40 years later, near the end of his life in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses is recapping and recapitulating the sacred history and, and God's travels with his people uh, from Egypt to the plains of Moab. And he looks back at this event and says, the Lord your God is a devouring fire, which is echoed, of course, in Hebrews 12, 29 by traditionally St. Paul as the author of Hebrews, quoting from Deuteronomy 
our God is a consuming fire. So what does that mean? And I don't think that these images that our Lord uh, uses of himself, that God uses of himself, like in certain instances, water for the Holy Spirit, in other cases, fire, as we're discussing today, these are not accidental. These are part of God's plan from the very beginning. Because the same God that created this world is also our Redeemer. The Creator and the Redeemer are the same, and the creation was designed with the redemption in mind. And so there's properties of fire and there's properties of water um, that communicate something about God's presence, and it's not accidental or, or capricious that he uses these images for himself. So let's meditate on fire for a moment what is true about fire? Well, one of the properties of fire is that it consumes things. I don't know why I have its things there. I don't know. Doing this late at night. Uh, fire consumes its fuel. That's what it was. I, I, I had its fuels and I changed it to things. Anyway, anyway. Okay. You know, fire burns things, right? And in the process, it consumes them and it transforms things into itself. So you put a log in the fireplace, the fire takes on the log, the fire consumes the log, and the fire transforms the log into fire, into itself. And that's one of the truths about God. God takes up others and transforms them into himself. And this is actually what the church fathers called theosis or divinization that we become partakers of the divine nature. This is a deep truth about fire and one of the reasons why God likens himself to it. But there are other qualities of fire, all of which are important. So fire purifies things. Fire cleanses. Fire sterilizes. You know, if you need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, inject something into your body. One of the ways that you can cleanse the needle is with a match, right? Maybe you've done that in, uh, in your growing up, etc., knowing that that sterilizes the needle. So fire purifies, it sterilizes, it removes impurities. We see this reflected in the Pentateuch, where when God gives his laws for his people, he allows them to cleanse things either by fire or by water. Everything that can stand the fire, you shall pass through the fire and it shall be clean. So that's preferable for objects that can withstand the heat. It's a preferable way to sterilize and to cleanse according to the Old Testament law. So fire is that image of purity. It's that image of cleansing. And then also fire produces light, uh, which guides us, which illumines our path and enables us to gain knowledge and to make headway and to travel. So in Exodus 13, 21, uh, the Lord in his mercy comes down to his people during the Exodus, and he guides them as a pillar of cloud uh, along the way, but by night he is a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night to illuminate the path that's ahead of them. And of course, the famous Verse from Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And so we talk about the light that's given by the Holy Spirit, which is the fire of God. But then also fire gives off warmth and uh, enables us to stay alive in the midst of the cold and the darkness, as Isaiah 44 speaks of using uh, a piece of wood for, full, for fuel, and a man takes a part of it and warms himself and kindles a fire. And so the fire of God provides that warmth in uh, what can often be experienced as a universe, an environment of cold and darkness. And we gravitate to the uh, life-giving warmth of the divine presence. And that same warmth, that same fire, can transform that which is inedible into food which can nourish our bodies. And so this is the 
miracle of cooking, which is one of the foundations of human culture. Fire is able to cook food, transforming something that you couldn't chew, that you couldn't digest, something that might have even been poisonous to you. And through that heat and through the exposure to fire, it becomes uh, nourishment for your body. It becomes digestible, becomes something that's not only not toxic, but is even pleasant to our taste, and it becomes food for us. And also, of course, there's the negative aspect of fire, which is that same warmth can turn out to be lethal. And so fire is dangerous. And so we tell our children, don't play with fire. Uh, we know it can, what it can do. And fire is frequently used in the scriptures as a sign for divine judgment. As Isaiah says, for by fire will the Lord execute judgment and by his sword upon all flesh. And so when we experience fire, it has both those attractive qualities it gives us warmth, it gives us light, it can be a source of life to us, it can be a source of guidance to us, and yet it also has that dangerous aspect that if we get too close or we mishandle it, it can also be to us a source of death. And so that's uh, very similar to what Dr. Hahn has described, you know, coming from Rudolf Otto of the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans. The, both the attractive and the frightening mystery of God. So we tremble in God's presence because God's presence can be lethal as fire can be. But we're also attracted like a moth to flame to the light, the warmth, the beauty, etc. And so God uses a fire as an image of himself. And like I said, I believe this is written into creation and just for five minutes, I want to make an aside and, and like uh, unfamiliarize ourselves with fire and come back at it with a new perspective. You know, first of all, do we realize that we're on the only planet in the universe where you can start a fire? At least the only known location in the entire cosmos. Do you realize you can't start a fire on any other planet in the solar system? not even on Mars. There's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars for anything to burn. And even if there was enough oxygen in Mars's atmosphere, there's no fuel. Have you looked around on the surface of Mars? From all those, you know, what do you see? Rocks and more rocks. And so we keep sending rovers back to look at the rocks. Okay, I don't know what it is. Like, oh, another rock. There's no wood, okay? And wood is what you need. Wood is a great fuel. Look at our planet, okay? Our planet has just the right amount of oxygen, and it's gotta be a balance. It's one of those things that scientists call a Goldilocks parameter, okay? You can't have too much oxygen, because that's, like, that's why you can't light up a cigarette when you're in a fighter plane, right? Foop, okay? Can't do that when you got too much oxygen. Everything, everything will, will incinerate, you know, more or less instantaneously. So we can't have too much oxygen in our atmosphere and everything would burn up spontaneously and we can't have too little or you wouldn't even be able to start a fire. So we got the Goldilocks amount of oxygen in the air that we have on this planet and therefore this planet is the only known place that we can see in all of the universe where you can actually start a fire. Have we really pondered that? And where would we be without fire? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Another wonderful thing about our planet is we got all these trees, okay? And, and wood is an unexcelled source of fuel. You know, if we did not have wood, which will burn at a high temperature, we could not melt metal, we couldn't have furnaces, and we couldn't develop human civilization. So imagine this. Imagine we didn't have the right amount of oxygen, or imagine we didn't have trees to provide fuel, then we would be without fire. And if we didn't have fire, what would we have? No cooked food, okay? There's some bachelors out there like, well, uh, I put up with that already. But no cooked food, no metal tools, because you can't melt and form metal, can't shape metal without 
the heat that fire provides, which would mean no cars, no planes, no appliances, no electronics. Of course, there's some people are like, yeah, it sounds like a great world. I'm part of the Greens. <laughs> no, we don't really want to do that. Okay. No telecommunications. We couldn't have this conference. We couldn't have these screens. You know, there would be basically no human civilization. We would be restricted to living only in a few places in the planet where you know, we could eat fruit and nuts all the time, and that's about, that's about all we would be able to do. So we really need to be grateful for this literally miracle of fire which God designed our planet for and even designed our bodies for. Because have you ever pondered this? Uh, we are the only species that can manipulate fire. You ever wondered why cats never developed a world-dominant civilization? I mean, they're clever and all, and they know how to sleep. But a cat can't manipulate anything to start a fire. And if, they, if cats could start a fire, they don't have anything that could, they could hold, hold the fire with that wouldn't like burn them. They could bite the torch or whatever, you know? But it would, it would singe them. You ever wonder why dolphins never created a world-dominant civilization? Well, they're in the water. And you can't start a fire down there, and, and thus you cannot work metal. You can't make a metal-based civilization. So they may be super smart, but hey, they're just going to be surfing and eating fish. You know, good life. But uh, you can't make a civilization. So in order to manipulate fire, you've got to be a terrestrial species. You have to live on the land. You've got to be out in the air. And then you have to have limbs. Think about the wonder of our arms. Our arms enable us to start a fire far away from our bodies, you know, and then get something that's on fire and hold it away from us, okay? So we can use its warmth and its light for guidance and, you know, its life-giving properties without being burned by it. And there's, an, there's studies that have been done about this by front rank scientists. I recommend this video. You can get it off of Amazon called FireMaker which is also all about how our planet and our human bodies are designed to be able to make use of fire. And this was in the mind of God from the beginning, I believe. And the fathers, you know, see this. You think, like, Berg's going to get off to science and get back to Scripture. But um, the, the church fathers, when they meditate on creation, they go into lengthy digressions about how different animals and different features of what was made by God in the six days represent different properties and virtues and are revelatory of God himself. And this is very much in the keeping with uh, the theology of St. Bonaventure, the great intellectual of the Franciscan tradition, which we stand in here at Franciscan University. St. Bonaventure who saw every creature as a sign of God and that you could begin by the meditation on any creature and use that creature as a pathway for the mind to travel into God. That's the theology of St. Bonaventure. So let's go back to the scriptures now, appreciating what a miracle this reality that we call fire is and how appropriate it is in so many ways to be used as a sign of God's presence. The first time that fire is mentioned in the Bible, here's a little fact for all those who, who like to play biblical trivial pursuit here, okay? First time we get the word ash, fire, in Scripture is actually when the covenant is made with Abraham for the first time in Genesis 15, 17. We know this, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. We're, of course, talking about the first time that God made a covenant with Abraham. We get this reading in the uh, third Sunday of Lent in year C, as a matter of fact, year C during Lent goes through salvation history. And uh, this was a momentous time. You remember how, Je uh, how Abraham went out and looked at the heavens and God told him, your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars. And Abraham said, well, Lord, how can I know this because I don't have any children and my heir is gonna be Eliezer of Damascus, my, my steward. And uh, God tells him to take these animals and cut their bodies in half 
and lay the animals side by side. And then Abraham does that and darkness falls. And when darkness falls, these two images of the divine presence appear, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch, and they move between the pieces of the animals. And this is an ancient covenant-making ritual. God condescends to make a covenant with Abraham using a human ritual. And in the ancient times, when you would walk between the pieces of the bisected animals, what you were saying was, if I don't keep this commitment that I'm making, may I become like these animals. In other words, may I die, may I be killed. And so God himself takes upon himself a curse of death to assure Abraham of the truth of God's promises to him, which is very mysterious and connects in a deep way to the death of Christ on the cross, although it would take us many turns and, um, uh, and, and twists to trace that all out. But the point here is that God is making the covenant with Abraham for the first time, and in particular, the imagery here of the smoke and the fire and the torch is anticipating when God will make the covenant for the first time with Abraham's descendants. It's already looking forward to Mount Sinai. And the imagery at Mount Sinai is going to be the same. It's going to be fire. It's going to be smoke. It's going to be torches, torches in the sky, which is how the Hebrews described lightning, which was present in Exodus 19 at Sinai. So this, uh, this covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, the first time that fire is mentioned in Scripture, is already looking forward to that definitive moment when God reveals himself as the great fire atop the mountain of Sinai to his people when that covenant is made uh, much later. And the next time that we find fire in the Bible is in judgment raining down on Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the deadly aspect of fire, which is always in the background and uh, God's fire being revealed from heaven against the wickedness of men. And so fire is dangerous, both attractive and yet fearful. And Moses experiences both those dimensions of fire centuries later when the time is growing near for the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham through Abraham's descendants. Remember how God promised to Abraham that his descendants would become a great nation? Well, when God calls Moses for the mission of going into Egypt and bringing out the people of Israel and forming them into a nation by giving them law and land, God appears to Moses as fire. We read in Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and lo, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And so the bush seems to be sharing in the divine nature because only God's nature can burn continually and yet never be consumed. And why is that? It's because God is infinite. It's without limit. He can continually be consumed and never reach the end of himself. And so this burning bush is a sign of God's nature and of God's presence. And Moses turns aside to see this remarkable reality of the burning bush, and he's commanded, of course, by God to take off his shoes because he is standing on holy ground. And then, of course, uh, the Lord commissions Moses to go into Egypt and to return with the people of Israel out to Mount Sinai. And as Moses is leading the people out into the desert to go to the holy mountain, again, God, in, in his kindness, comes down to lead the people himself. And so we read in Exodus 13 that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So the God who revealed himself in fire in the bush is now revealing himself to uh, the people of Israel as the pillar of fire, leading them out to the mountain where God reveals himself 
in fire at the top of the mountain. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Here the imagery that was already anticipated back in Genesis 15, when God made that covenant with Abraham, accompanies God's presence here, where the covenant between God and his people is about to be formed in Exodus uh, 24. And, uh, of course, we know that after the covenant was formed in Exodus 24, there was just a brief uh, 40-day honeymoon before the people got impatient and bored and decided to go back to good old foot stomp and snake handling Egyptian bowl worship, right? Which is what they had been used to for 400 years in Egypt. Yeah, that's our true religion. Oh, yeah, I love that bowl, love that bowl, love that bowl. <laughs> Woohoo! yeah, just like old times. Festival of praise around the bowl. And um, we know how that whole incident. So they go back to idolatry, but then God's nature of judgment is revealed again as fire is employed to judge the people and to judge the bowl. In the aftermath of the idolatry, Moses comes down, takes the calf which they had made and burnt it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it upon the water, made the people of Israel drink it. So they consume uh, this false divinity that they had uh, made, and it is consumed itself in the flames of fire, the consuming fire of judgment. And after the calf is destroyed, uh, God, of course, provides for his continued presence to be with his people in the tabernacle. But in, within the tabernacle, in the holy place, there was a, uh, several signs of God's presence, but one of the signs of God's presence was, of course, the burning menorah, where uh, God's presence as fire was made known, but in a peaceful way, in terms of casting light so that the priests could do their duties within the holy place and, um, and, and burn the incense before the veil, the veil that covered the most holy place, which was, in fact, in darkness. And so uh, Moses commands the craftsmen to make the lampstand of pure gold, and the base and the shaft of the lampstand were hammered work, cups, capitals, and flowers, all of one piece. This, this lampstand is one of the signs of, indeed, the Holy Spirit, but more broadly of God's nature who God is in himself. And then not only was there the lampstand within the tabernacle as the tabernacle moved with the people as a sign of presence, but the fire, the fire that had previously moved along with the people as cloud descended and engulfed the tabernacle at the end of the book of Exodus um, as a sign of God dwelling within this tent which uh, God had commanded Moses to make so that he could live and move and be in the midst of his people. So throughout all their journeys, it says in Exodus 40, 38, the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and the fire was in it by night in the sight of all Israel. And so it went for the rest of the Pentateuch. And we could trace that theme forward. We we remember, and Dr. Hahn mentioned this last night, about how Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offered unholy fire before the Lord, unauthorized fire. And it says that fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And this is actually uh, happens multiple times, frequently during the rebellious wilderness wanderings where from Numbers 11 through Numbers 25, 10 times in the wilderness, the people rebel against God. Frequently, the punishment of that is fire that comes forth from the presence of God, striking down those who offend against the holiness of God. So all through the wilderness wandering, there is the presence of fire uh, coming from God, signs of fire as God's presence and that at the end of the wilderness wanderings, when they are on the plains of Moab, only days before the death of Moses, 
Uh, Moses in his great valedictory, which is essentially the book of Deuteronomy, his great farewell speech or his farewell sermon. You thought your pastor preached for a long time. What, because he goes over 10 minutes? There's 34 chapters of Deuteronomy. That's Moses' homily, okay? So anyway, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, 22, Moses is looking back over the course of the wilderness wanderings, and Moses recalls and he recites for the second generation that grew up in the wilderness and is about to enter the land, he recalls what their parents saw at Sinai. But Moses uses a little preacher's technique, and he describes it as if you were there, okay? So he addresses the children who are not, but Moses says, you were there, okay? And I used to have, back in South Bend in the parish that I joined when I became Catholic, I had a, uh, one of the pastors there who used this technique. He would always describe us uh, describe our congreg congregation as we good Catholics, right? He'd say, we good Catholics pray every day with the family around the dinner table. We good Catholics pray the rosary daily. We good Catholics are aware of what our politicians are supporting in, in Congress, you know, all stuff. I'm like thinking about how many of the people really here are doing daily, uh, you know, prayer with the kids, you know, and so but anyway, it's this projection, right? Okay, so you are there, you are, you know, the, you are these people. And uh, Moses uses this technique, and what does he say? He says, these words the Lord spoke at the mountain out of the midst of the fire with a loud voice. And when you heard the voice of the midst of the darkness, again, it's their parents, but it's this kind of sacramental realism, okay? As, it, as we say, as uh, it's said in Judaism, Every Jew must regard himself as personally having participated in the Exodus. Okay, that's one of the, one of the, you might call it almost a dogma of Judaism, right? With loud voice, when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me and said, behold, we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have this day seen God speak with man and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, we shall die. For who is there that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and has still lived? And so the people of Israel were so fearful at God's fiery presence the fire of God's holiness at the foot of Sinai, that they begged Moses to speak to them rather than to hear the words of God because of the terror that it struck in them. Because this is the problem of the holiness of God. We're attracted to it, we desire it, and yet it can be lethal to us, especially in our sinfulness. And so the dilemma of the human condition is how can we enter into the presence of God, which is the source of all light and life, but how can we enter into that presence without ourselves being consumed by it? Because, of course, we are finite. God himself is not consumed by the fire of his love and the fire of his holiness because he is infinite fuel, so to speak. There is no end of God. But how do we, in our finitude, and indeed, especially in our sins come into the presence of a holy God without being consumed. This, in a sense, is the dilemma of salvation history. And how is God going to solve this in order to draw a people to himself that can participate in his nature without being destroyed by contact with his nature? And so we're going to take a big jump uh, all the way into the new covenant era that comes to replace the, uh, the old covenant established by Moses, the old covenant in which the solution to the dilemma was to remove uh, God's people from his direct presence and put in place various mediators, <coughs> namely Moses and the Levites and the high priest, etc., 
at a remove to keep the people close and yet not intimate with the presence of God so they're not consumed. But how do we close that gap and come to a better covenant where we can enter in and even indeed uh, abandon ourselves into the nature of God? Well, it begins with John the Baptist, a great prophet, a prophet who stands in the prophetic tradition going back to Moses. Moses and John the Baptist are almost bookends around the whole prophetic succession of the Old Covenant. And John comes and John discusses fire as he stands in the waters of the Jordan preaching to the people of Israel. He tells them, look, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is, in his, fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. All right, so John the Baptist is the original hellfire and brimstone preacher. Okay? I just got to love John the Baptist, you know. Guys all sunburnt from being out in the in the elements, you know, he's covered with bee stings from tearing into those beehives to get the honey, you know, he's wearing a hair garment with a leather, leather girdle, and, uh, you know, come on, his wedding fork is in his hand, he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. He got the honey and a grasshopper leg dripping down his beard. And you're like, oh, I repent, I repent. <laughs> no TV back then. It's the best show in town. But notice something interesting about this, uh, brothers and sisters. We have two groups here. We have those who are going to receive baptism from the Messiah when he comes, who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's talking about Christian baptism. Those are those who receive. They, the, that's the grain, okay? The grain is going to receive the Holy Spirit and fire. But the chaff is going to receive unquenchable fire. So actually, both the grain and the chaff are going to experience fire. So the fate of both the grain and the chaff, in a profound sense, is the same. They are both going to experience the fire of God. The, the uh, fundamental difference, though, is that the grain is not going to be consumed by exposure to the fire of God, whereas the chaff is going to be consumed by it. And what is John the Baptist looking forward to? What is he anticipating when he talks about the baptism with Holy Spirit and with fire? Well, he's looking forward, of course, to Pentecost, among other things. And we read in Acts 2, after the resurrection of our Lord and in the birth of the church's body, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So we're on a mountain a mountain called Zion. And we have God's presence on that mountaintop. And we have fire. And we have wind. And we have burning there. Huh. When did we see this before? I'm having a kind of deja vu experience. A mountain of God's presence burning with fire and shaken by wind. Why, this, of course, is Mount Sinai except that the fire of God's presence at Mount Sinai was fear-inducing, and the fire of God's presence here on Mount Zion is attractive and draws people towards itself. But there's a, a, a deep connection of the two because, of course, Pentecost was and is a Jewish holiday before it is a Christian holiday. You ever wonder about that? Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost came, 
I used to read that when I was, you know, 13 years old. My mother made me start reading the Bible through in a year when I was 12, you know. So every year I come around to this passage of Acts, and I'm like, wait a second. The church isn't up and running yet. So how are they, you know, how are they observing Pentecost, right? How do they know to count to Pentecost? Well, what I didn't realize was, again, Pentecost was and is a Jewish holy day. It remains the only holy day in both the Jewish liturgical calendar and the Christian liturgical calendar that we have in common. So Pentecost was also called the Feast of Weeks, and I'll be talking about this in my breakout session uh, later this afternoon. And so they counted seven weeks uh, from um, Passover, really from the day after Passover, and then on the seven weeks is 49 days, and then on the 50th day, that was uh, the Feast of Pentecost, and Passover celebrated the beginning of the grain harvest with the first of the barley, which was the first grain to ripen, and Pentecost celebrated the end of the grain harvest with the last of the wheat, which was the last to ripen over a course of a 50-day harvest season. And so at Pentecost, it celebrated the incoming of the wheat, but if you count in the Pentateuch, it is also 50 days from when the people of Israel leave Egypt at the Passover until they arrive at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, and God reveals himself, and they have the covenant. The covenant is made. And so Pentecost was the feast of the Jews where they gathered in Jerusalem and they celebrated the giving of the law, the giving of the Ten Commandments, when God spoke the ten words out of the fire that was burning on the top of the mountain. So you see how all the imagery converges. And so now on the day of Pentecost, we're having the giving of the new law of the new covenant, because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the new law of the new covenant is nothing other than the grace of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is going to replace God's law written on tablets of stone. And God's Holy Spirit is fiery. And it, the, the nature of the Spirit is revealed to the visible eye here as the 12 apostles become like a living human menorah in the holy place, each of them like a candle illuminated and lit up with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And so a, a, a mighty wind came, filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the 12 on the day of Pentecost. We know how this, um, how this played out. Peter preaches under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They, they are cut to the heart in Acts 2.37. They say, brethren, what must we do to be saved? Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. Uh, every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's happening here is God's fire, his nature, the Holy Spirit, is being shared with the apostles. They are burning with the fire of the Holy Spirit, but they are not being consumed. And why are they not being consumed? It's because the Holy Spirit is like the hydrant you know, the inexhaustible hydrant of God's nature. You know, when, when uh, I, uh, several of my kids are first responders, and, you know, one of my daughters is a fireman, my son-in-law is a fireman, they go to a fire. If they have to hook up to their tanker truck, they know they've got about 15 minutes of water in that tanker truck, and then they're going to be out. And so if they're dependent on their trucks to put out a structure fire, that is not a likely proposition. And so what do they look for? They look for that hydrant because they have to have an inexhaustible supply that they can keep giving, keep pouring out, you know? And so the Holy Spirit within us is that river that Jesus speaks about in John 7, 37. 
that river of life that he also spoke to the woman at the well and that connection, that interior connection, that interior hydrant, if you will, of the fuel of God's nature, the Holy Spirit that keeps pouring out and so we can stay lit and never be extinguished and not be consumed. God is sharing his nature. This is the answer to the, to the dilemma. How can each one of us be like the burning bush? How can we participate in God's nature? How can we uh, experience, indeed, how can we be bathed in the burning fires of God's love? How can we be a torch of the fire of God's love, warming and illuminating our homes and our parishes and our workplaces without ourselves being consumed? It's by the inexhaustible supply of the Holy Spirit who keeps sharing God's nature with us. As Peter says in 2 Peter 1.4, we become partakers of the divine nature. So our God is a consuming fire, a fire of love, a fire of love that indeed causes suffering because in our finitude and in our sinfulness, when we become those living torches, that fire burns away our selfishness, it burns away our sin, it burns away that within us which is not consecrated to God, that which in us is not united to God himself, and that can be a painful process, and that was what Jeff was talking about us, talking to us about so movingly in the last talk. Here we're meditating upon that, that fire of God's love, which is also his holiness, which can cause us pain, but which purifies us. That is his nature, and we are all going to experience it, right? We're either going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit of fire, or we're going to be burned up in the unquenchable flame. And so I think we need to grasp this. There is no way out. Every human being is going to experience the fire of God in one form or another, the answer then is, how can we endure God's fire? Well, for those who go to hell, okay, those who are sent to hell are those for whom the fires of God are painful. Okay? Remember, fire can be different depending on what the material is. If you stick an object of high quality into a fire, it starts to glow like say, an object of titanium or some other very pure and high-quality metal. You stick into the fire, and after a while, that metal takes on the nature of fire. This is an analogy that the, that the church fathers used. And so that metal itself becomes hot, and it glows, and it takes on the color of the flames. And that's an image of the saints who take on the divine nature when they're plunged into the divine nature but are not destroyed by the divine nature. On the other hand, if you stick an old dry stick into the furnace, it's consumed because it cannot endure the flames of God. And so at the final judgment, those who are destined for hell are going to find God's presence very painful. People who are set against God do not like to be in God's presence. I saw this in a very visceral way when I was a Protestant pastor and I did a lot of evangelism. One of the things I noticed was that a lot of people that were like dead set against the church or had really kind of quite consciously turned their back on God, they did not even like to be around a church. The, the, the thing we used to say is he wouldn't darken the door of a church, right? But they were literally uncomfortable, right, to come into a holy place or anything else that, you know, mediated or radiated the presence of God. That made them uncomfortable and they would avoid that. And so at the final judgment, when we're all exposed to the direct presence of God, there's many people that are going to be very uncomfortable in the flaming fires of God's love. And so God, in his mercy, is going to cast those people as far away from himself as possible, which is described in, in the Gospel of Matthew as outer darkness. And I really regard hell as a kind of mercy of God, because those who experience God's presence as pain God has mercy on them and says, because you experience my presence as pain, I'm going to cast you as far from me as possible so that you have the least experience of my presence. But even that minimal experience of their presence that they have in hell, because God cannot completely withdraw his presence, 
because his presence is what keeps us in being. And he can't annihilate us because to annihilate us would be to deny his love for us. And God cannot deny his love for his creatures. And so even in hell, there is this minimal presence of God that supplies being to those who are in hell. And even that minimal presence of God causes pain to those who are in hell. And indeed, in hell, there is self-hatred because we cannot avoid the fact that we are made in God's image. And so even that in that, that uh, unerasable, that irradicable image of God that's within us becomes a source of pain for those who reject God and turn their back on him intentionally. And that causes the sufferings that are described as the fires of hell, even though God in his mercy has removed them as far from himself. And so that's one fate. And another fate, of course, is purgatory, which is only temporary, but that is we're drawn to the presence of God, and yet we did not embrace the sufferings that were sent to us in this life that Jeff was talking to us about. We resisted them, we rejected them, we tried to flee from them, etc., and don't embrace them and allow them to do their work. And thus, when we reach the end of our temporal life, there's still work that needs to be done. And so God, in his mercy, it's always God's mercy, Hell is mercy, purgatory is mercy. God in his mercy doesn't cast us away, but allows the fire of his love to continue its work and to purify us. And then, of course, the, the best fate that we all desire is heaven when we are purified like that fine titanium or that, that fine high-quality gemstone or whatever you might liken it to that can be plunged into the fire and just takes the nature of fire, absorbs the light, it begins to glow and becomes like God because we share in God's presence. These are the saints. These are, this is St. Teresa of Calcutta. This is St. Catherine of Siena. These are the saints that are burning with the fire of God and not consumed because they partake in the nature of God. So fire consumes the fuel, changes it into itself, God is going to change us into himself in heaven. And so the path to salvation is to be transformed into God's nature now, as St. Peter says, partakers of the divine nature. And how do we do that? Well, we open ourselves up into the, to the presence of God. You're doing that by coming to this conference to hear the words of God spoken from the fire rather than running from them as the people of Israel did on the mountain. You came from wherever you live all the way to Steubenville to hear the words coming forth from the fire. You've gathered, okay, to be inflamed by that fire. So you're making that step to expose yourself to God and to God's word and to the sacraments. Remember how the burning coal from the altar in Isaiah 6 was understood by the fathers as an image of the Eucharist that brings forth that fire of God that touches our lips, that purifies. Remember we talked about how fire purifies, cleanses, sterilizes, purifies us from a sin and sets our hearts in fire. Did our hearts not burn within us when he spoke God's word? So meditation on God's word, opening our lives up to prayer, making time for God on a daily basis in prayer, setting aside those holy times, which we've been so bad at. And I'm going to talk about that in my breakout session exposing ourselves to God in, in, the, in, uh, the, uh, in sacred time, uh, the, the Lord's Day and the other great feast days of the church. And then also, especially as, as Jeff was speaking to us, embracing those sufferings, which are the purifying fires of God's love, learning to understand that they are given to us out of signs of God's love, the reversals, the difficulties within our family, difficulties with children, difficulties with spouses, financial reverses, a sadness over the state of our, of our homes, our families, our communities, our parish, uh, the nation as a, lar as a whole, the worldwide church, all those sorrows, all those challenges, allow them to do, God, do God's work. Allow them to burn away from you all that which is not God, so that you put your hope in nothing else but in God himself, that you seek no sustenance except that which comes from the Holy Spirit, that you don't reach out to wine for inebriation, but you enter into the Holy Spirit to be inebriated by the Holy Spirit, the fires of God's love which will sustain you. This is what we seek. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day 
for uh, drawing us into your presence and transforming us into yourself. Lord, help us, help us in this high calling. Help us to comprehend what you're calling us to. Um, uh, soften our wills, warm our wills uh, by, by your gentle warmth so that we can say yes to you and grow in strength until we can withstand the, the fire of your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.